The reading this morning is taken from John 8, reading verses 2 to 11. <clears throat> At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Thank you, Val. Thank you, uh, Paul, as well, for leading in the prayers. So we've got this um, story in John chapter 8 today, um, entitled The Woman Caught in Adultery. Um, but is this story authentic? Should it actually be there in um, chapter 8 or not in the Bible? Um, if you have read your Bible and um, looked at in, in this particular part of it, you'll see there's a little note above this story that says um, that this story wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. So should it be here or not is our first question today. Um, now, it's true that this passage wasn't in all of the earliest um, manuscripts that people found, and uh, it was found later on, and it was added uh, here. And people aren't sure whether it should have been added in Luke's gospel because it was written by him, or whether it should have been added in uh, John's gospel um, because it was written by him or, or something else. So they're the main two possibilities. And in some versions of the Bible, it has been put in, in Luke, um, but mainly it's put in John's gospel and it's put in different places. But this is the main place that it's put as chapter eight. So um, is it authentic? Yes, I believe it is authentic. It's definitely um, a story that there's plenty of evidence for that it is a true story of Jesus. The question is in which gospel it should be, who actually, which gospel writer wrote it and which place it should come in the passage. Remember the Bible was put together later and uh, uh, with all the different bits together and, um, and it could be um, that this could go somewhere else. But the reason it's been placed here and is in the majority of places is probably because it seems to fit so well at this particular point. Um, last week we had John chapter 7, which was all about judgment. It was about um, Jesus says to them in, in John chapter 7 verse 24, you need to make a right judgment. You're judging by appearances. You need to make a right judgment here. And they're all trying to judge, as you told us last week, who Jesus was. Who, who is this man? He's, he's, he's from, he's not, he, you know, he's come from Galilee. He can't be the Messiah and so on. And they were trying to question that. Um, so it's about judgment. And then in chapter eight, it also goes on to talk about judgment. So in John chapter eight, verse 15, we didn't quite get that far in our reading. But in verse 15, it's Jesus says, I pass judgment on no one. And of course, in this story, he's just not passed judgment on the woman. He said, neither do I condemn you. So it fits nicely there. It's also interesting to see that at the beginning of this story, in, um, it starts off in chapter eight with the, the, the people trying to stone the woman right at the beginning. That's what this story is about. The people want to, the, the Jews and the Pharisees and teachers of the law want to stone the woman. And the chapter eight ends with people trying to stone Jesus. 
So uh, topically and everything else, it just seems to fit just right there. And of course, it may have meant to have been there all along. We don't know uh, the exact place in the Bible this is meant to be. It could be that it was always meant to be there. It might not be. Um, but this is where it's placed. But but because the Bible wants to be, the writers want people to, to know the genuineness of the Bible. They do need to point out and want to point out it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts, uh, whereas the, a lot of the rest of it was. So they always point that out in in there so do i believe it's authentic yes absolutely and the, the majority of scholars um do believe that were the pharisees right is our next question were they right that um this woman needed to be should have been stoned well old testament law certainly said that if a person was caught in the act of adultery by two witnesses they had to be caught by two witnesses, then yes, they could face capital punishment and in this case, stoning. Um, I, I believe that the stoning came if they were actually engaged and it might be strangled if they were married, but stoned if they're engaged. But either way, it's gruesome. Um, but this is, um, uh, so it was true in that sense. Were they right is a different question though. Were the Pharisees right? Because actually it could be and many surmise this is the case, that the Pharisees have set a trap up for Jesus um, with this. Well, it actually says in the scripture it was that they were trapping him with the question. But it could be that the whole thing was a setup that they had either encouraged a woman into adultery or had watched her um, doing it. And then she committed adultery. And as soon as she did, they grabbed her and they took her to Jesus. Now, if that's the case, then the Pharisees have sinned straight away in themselves. Because um, if you see someone about to sin, the law says you're meant to stop them. So if they'd done this as a kind of setup, uh, apart from the fact that it's a setup, um, then they should have stopped her if they knew she was going to do it before she did. If they didn't know she was going to do it before she did, then it would just have to be by chance that they found her in the act at that exact time when Jesus was in the temple teaching and that they could use it and they've as it says, they're set a trap for Jesus with the question. That's quick thinking on their part to do all of that in that time. Um, it's So many people think that's unlikely. It was all part of their plan. But they brought the woman to Jesus. The second thing they did wrong was they meant to bring the man as well. How does he get off with it? Because the law said that it was both the man and the woman had to be stoned. But they've only brought the woman. Was the guy in on it or not? Anyway, that's there. Then they bring them straight to Jesus. After the act, they caught her in the act. They take her to Jesus. So what state she's in dress-wise and so on, we don't know. And throw her in front of Jesus, to stand in front of Jesus, in front of all the crowd, and call her out there. This woman's been caught in adultery. Can you imagine how she felt? It's so uncaring, so, uh, so horrible to put the woman in this position and stand her there in front of everybody. And in front of Jesus and um, and asking this question there so and it does say that they were trying to trap Jesus so their motivation is wrong apart from all these other mistakes all these other things that were wrong the motivation is wrong as well trying to trap and condemn uh, Jesus so were the Pharisees right well technically to do with the law on stoning someone in adultery yes but no on all these other points and they ask Jesus this question. They say, should we stone him? Should we stone her? The law says this. What are you going to do, Jesus? What do you say? So what does Jesus say? He knows that if he says, um, don't stone her, then they're going to condemn him because he's not upholding the law, as the law says. And he knows that. And, and what's going to happen is then he'll be condemned and he'll die. Um, and then, and he's not ready to die yet. And if he says, yes, do stoner, then all the people will say, well, you're a hypocrite because you're talking about love and forgiveness and mercy. And here you are not forgiving this woman and standing here. Well, we're throwing stones at her and just uh, supporting that. And then she dies as well. And Jesus knows that the woman would die. So it's a very difficult one. That's why it was a trap for Jesus. What does he say? What does he do? See, I think Jesus knew that he was in the midst of a tension here. Um, uh, it's kind of a juxtaposition between his, uh, between mercy 
and uh, forgiveness and righteous judgment. In the Old Testament, we see a lot of the time um, where Jesus is, where, where, sorry, where God's uh, judgment is carried out on mankind in very clear ways. People do die. The law's there to say, if you sin, you should receive the consequence of that sin. And sometimes that is death as well, um, physical death while on the earth. At one point, we see God's anger with sin right near the beginning, where he wiped out most of the earth with a flood because he was so angry with it. And we know that, G that God felt so strongly about sin um, and it was such a problem that ultimately he had to send Jesus to come and die and take the price for sin on the cross himself. So sin is a big problem, um, a barrier between man and God. Um, and that's why the, the punishment, the consequence was so strong in certain places to send a warning to the people often. You cannot do this. This is wrong. It's a real problem. Sin is a big problem. So Jesus knows that. He also knows he's come to die, to provide a way because he knows that people struggle with it. He knows they keep failing and he's coming to pay the price for it. Jesus said, I've, I've not come to do away with the law. I've come to fulfill the law, to take the punishment that mankind deserves upon myself on the cross so that you don't have to take that punishment. And ultimately, that would be for this woman, too, that she could be forgiven. But Jesus hasn't got to the cross yet. He's here. He's come to earth to do this. But the law is still there. And Jesus is about to fulfill the law. But he hasn't quite yet. And they're putting Jesus in this position. So what are we going to do to this woman then? You see the, the difficulty for Jesus in this situation. So what does Jesus do well he says he writes on the ground he bends down and writes on the ground well what's what's he writing on the ground now people have um looked at this and come up with all kinds of ideas one of the ideas of what jesus might have been writing on the ground is that he was writing jeremiah 17 verse 13 which is those who turn from you will be written in the dust no doubt he's talking about all the people that have sinned and the pharisees bringing her along and you know so on and so forth those who turn from you will be written in the dust so he could have been writing jeremiah 17 13 others have thought that maybe it was genesis 3 um, verse 19 that he was referring to it talks there about from dust to dust and why would that be written well people say um that uh, there's, a, there's this medieval idea that earth accuses earth and that Jesus in some way is kind of writing this down saying, you guys, you're, you're dust yourselves, you're earth yourselves accusing earth. And yet you're, you know, you're, you're making these judgments as just as, as, as earthly people, not thinking about this from in God's way, really. That's not your thought here. Um, another idea is Exodus chapter 23, verse 1 where it says, do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. So all these are ideas that people have come up with as to what Jesus might have been writing on the ground at that time. I wonder what you think. What was Jesus writing? Well, do you know what? It doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't say what he was writing. Um, and that's probably because it wasn't important. I'd love to know. It would be interesting, wouldn't it? What was he writing on the ground at that point? But it obviously wasn't important. Um, so perhaps the better question is, the one we should be asking is, why did he write on the ground? Why did he write on the ground in that moment? Was it to give him thinking time? Um, and he just kind of doodling on the ground while he was thinking about what his answer would be? I, I think it might be more than that. I think there might be some more significance. What are the other possibilities? Well, one is that he was writing like, the finger of God. Remember, Jesus um, is God in human form. And it talks about in Luke 11, verse 20, it talks about the finger of God. Um, and, and maybe Jesus was in some way illustrating that he's the one that can make these. Uh, he's the one that, that is uh, the, the author of life. And it's up to him to pass judgment. Um, they're, they're challenging him about it and putting him on the spot. But, but he is God himself and they should just um, uh, they shouldn't be accusing each other like that. Um, the same finger the same finger wrote law on the tablets in 
Exodus chapter 32. It was God's hand himself that wrote the law. So as the originator of the law that they were using, he had the right to do whatever he wanted. And if he wanted to let the woman go free, he had the right to do that because he makes the laws and it's up to him whether he um, changes them or not at any point because he is God, uh, Jesus, God in human form. So maybe it was something to do with that. And uh, some people have surmised that as well. But I wonder about another alternative here. And I want to just put that to you this morning. And I don't know if this is true or not. Um, but I like to think about it anyway, because I think it can teach us something and, and, and help us when we also think about um, passing judgment on others. I think Jesus maybe teaches us all more than we think in this story, in a way, whether deliberately or not. I want to show you a painting, a picture. Let's put that up on the screen just now. Now, this is a painting by a guy called Peter uh, Bruegel. It was um, painted, it's an oil painting from 1565 AD. And it's called Christ and the Woman Taken in Adultery. And I want you to look at that painting. And uh, you don't need to say it out loud. But you can talk amongst yourselves if you're with other people in your home or just think yourself. Um, what stands out to you in that picture? Have a good look at it. What do you notice? OK, well, um, let me ask you this question. What are people looking at? What are people looking at in that picture? I wonder if any of you spotted that. What are people looking at? I think everyone's eyes are looking at what Jesus is writing. Everyone's looking at what Jesus is writing there at the moment. Are they not? And as they're bowed down, as they're looking down, looking at what Jesus is writing, none of them are looking at the woman. What Jesus has done is took the focus off the woman that everyone's accusing. And by crouching down, which it says Jesus did, by, by stooping down and writing on the ground, all the focus is now on him. And, and what he's doing. The focus has been taken off the guilty person, the woman, onto Jesus. Jesus doesn't want us pointing the finger at each other. He wants us to look to him. It's kind of like as he's gone down on the ground, and I'll do it here. We can take the picture off now and uh, put me back on um, again. Thanks, Dan. Um, and as he's gone down on the ground and he's right on the ground everyone's looking at jesus and then he he sits up again they keep questioning him and he sits up again and as he straightens up he says let him who is without sin cast the first stone let him who is without sin cast the first stone and what do they do now as he says that, he then stoops down again on the ground. He goes down on the ground again and he carries on writing. And, um, and, and the reason he said that is in Deuteronomy 13, verse 9, it says those who see a crime and accuse someone else must be the first ones to cast the stone. So Jesus is quoting scripture back at them there and saying, well, you've got to be the ones to do it then. So Jesus has taken the focus. Um, off the woman and he's put the focus on himself as he's gone down on the ground and he is down on the ground again he's put the focus on himself as they look at him and then he looks up and he says this to them and now where is everyone looking now where are all the people looking well you know what I think 
I think they're all probably um, looking at the ground themselves because um, they're now looking at themselves in a way. They're thinking themselves about what they've done. Because Jesus has put it back on them. Him who is out sin cast the first stone. And so as he puts it back on them, they have to look at themselves and then they realise that they've all done wrong, probably in the very act of bringing this woman to him, as I explained earlier, and just in life, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as they realise that, they just have to hang their head. And it says, starting with the oldest one, they just drop the stone and walk away. Jesus is saying, if you're going to fulfil the law... You need to make sure you fulfill every part of it, not just the bits that you want to. So, and then Jesus looks up again and he says to the woman, um, as he straightens up, he addresses her for the first time, he speaks to her and he says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no, not one. And he said, well, then neither do I. But then he says something instant and, and we can't forget this bit he says go now and leave your life of sin see jesus didn't make light of a sin sin matters it, it grieves god it's a problem because it breaks the relationship between us but he did forgive her and told her to sin no more in light of his love and grace he expects her to repent and to turn from sin and I want to ask you a question. What would Jesus say if this woman in a few weeks time was brought back to him again? If some people grabbed her and brought her along again and said, Jesus, you know that woman you talked to before and you said she could go? It, she's been at it again. She's committed adultery again. Here she is. Should we stone her this time? What do you think that Jesus would say? Well, I'll tell you what I think. He would say, he would probably say, and I don't know for sure, but he would probably say exactly the same again. Because Jesus is full of love and mercy and grace and wants to continually forgive us our sin. But I also know that there comes a point of final judgment. When we die, we face God, the ultimate judge, and we'll all have to answer. And those who put faith in Jesus Christ will be, uh, 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 their sins are forgiven and washed away. But those that haven't will face condemnation and eternal separation from God. And that won't be good. And the thing is, in light of that, as someone once said um, to Paul, I think it was in the Bible, does that mean we should go on sinning then? because we're forgiven and he said by no means by no means at all um in effect that's just like that's being so ungrateful to god and hurtful if this woman just kept doing that how hurtful how ungrateful that would be if she just kept doing that and don't test the patience of god in that jesus came to save not condemn our right response should be when he forgives should be um to, to serve him with a life of love back again but judgment will come at the end of life for those that don't um, repent and turn to him and jesus calls us all to address our own sin before all pointing out the sins of others we need to remember that um he wants to take the focus off when we're pointing at others he wants to take us back to him to look at jesus again and to, to think of Jesus, not their sin, to think of Jesus who paid the price for sin. And he also wants us to remember our own sin and that we've been forgiven too. And in light of that, then look differently at the person who we're seeking to judge. A different angle on that story, perhaps, and some thoughts for us all as we go forward. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your love and your mercy and your forgiveness and your grace. I thank you for your wisdom in the way that you answered the Pharisees and teachers of the law when they tried to trap you in this situation. Um, Lord, we thank you that ultimately you went on to die and pay the price for our sin upon the cross. 
and you rose again and you are here with us now again in your love and your mercy and your grace help us to focus on you rather than the failings of one another for we all know that we fail in many ways um, but lord thank you that you lift us up you raise our heads to look to you thank you that we can rejoice in you and walk with you daily lord help us to do that and to uh, to be good witnesses for you amongst others and uh, lord we continue to be grateful and to serve you with a grateful and thankful hearts for all you've done. I pray for anyone here this morning that hasn't known your forgiveness yet. May they also come to know that through repenting and saying sorry for their sin, for things they've done wrong and, uh, and committing to follow you, Jesus. We ask it in your precious name. Amen.